Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here at the San Francisco Public Library for the Building Resilience Summit Series 9. Um, I am Rachel, one of the librarians that works in the county jails here in San Francisco. And just a little bit of housekeeping before the program gets started. Um, we're on the lower, lowest level of the library. You can go up one flight to exit. There are restrooms, gender neutral restrooms, right outside near the stairs to the left. And there are other restrooms one flight up as well. Um, and before I start the program, we always offer a land acknowledgement for the land that we're on. So the San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. So with that, I'll hand this over to Marcus and Brian from Returning Citizens Association. Oh, thank, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. And hello. Okay. I think I'm on here. Uh, key. Okay. Um, thank you, Rachel, for uh, this opportunity and, and hosting us here today. Um, we're grateful that we have this platform to speak and, uh, and talk to members of, of the community about uh, some of the things that we have personally experienced and uh, our family members have gone through as well. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, there's an opening um, to the program and uh, I want to um, say that this is like the first time I've ever hosted <laughs> so bear with me but there's kind of like a there's there's kind of a, a uh, you know a little play here that that I'm going to go with. Um, so Today's theme is uh, the resilience for a purpose, and it's presented by the Returning C Citizens Association. Um, I am Brian Tomasello. I am a returning citizen. Uh, I am also a project director within the organization here. Uh, I am a former life-term inmate who spent nearly 18 years in prison. I went to the parole board five times before earning my, my release. I have um, now established myself in the community as a, as a member, a returning citizen, and I'm proud to say that, uh, that like I, I tell many people, um, I've not only talked it, but now I walk it. Um, so RCA is a program that is for those who have been uh, system impacted uh, if you haven't spent time in the system, you could still have been affected uh, either, you know, through being a victim of a crime or also a member of a family uh, member who's been incarcerated. Um, you know, our mission is to increase the economic, political, and social capital of returning citizens in the United States. That means we need to provide resources, guidance, and community that help individuals successfully reintegrate, never go back, and rebuild their lives. It's a huge goal, and we can't do it alone. We need everyone's help. Uh, your support is vital in helping us continue our work. There are many ways that you can donate. Uh, you can visit our website, and the information will be provided to you at the end of this program. <clears throat> um, I want to say that uh, we also have a podcast uh, the podcast is, uh, uh, um, you know, it's a monthly subscription. Um, it keeps you informed and inspires uh, with the latest episodes. Uh, you can go to Spotify and search for Retor Returning Citizens Association. Uh, we also have a clothing line, uh, Returning Citizens Association. You can support by visiting www.rcaby.com. We have a magazine that, that we issue quarterly called Tapped In Magazine. And um, there is a uh, subscription that's available. Also, um, if you'd like to get on a, a quarterly uh, subscription, uh, that's available. Uh, you can also volunteer um, at one of our programs. We do weekly non-clinical mental health support groups. 
a safe place uh, for individuals to share their experiences and receive uh, support. Weekly reentry membership or mentorship, uh, guidance and mentorship to help individuals navigate the reentry process and get them ready to come home. Your contribution will directly support these programs, empowering returning citizens to rebuild their lives and thrive. I want to say thank you uh, for all your support. And again, um, this is Building Resilience Summit Series Act Number Nine. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have three speakers today who uh, who are on. on um, on tap. Uh, the first one that we'll be speaking today is a, a friend of mine, Marcus Spears. Sanders. And, or excuse me, Marcus Spears. He didn't Sanders. give me a, a I, new name. I, I, <laughs> Spears. I'm spearheading right now. <laughs> yeah. Let's I'm get sorry. it. Sorry about that. <laughs> I apologize. It's all Marcus good. Sanders. You know, we yeah. go back. And, um, <clears throat> and what I want to say about Marcus is that uh, Marcus grew up in an area um, that I am very familiar with, that I too grew up. Um, and, and he was older, one of the older guys, um, of, of my generation, not by much, but older than, than I was. Yeah. And, uh, and so he has a lot of insight into what life was like then and, and, and who he is now is a, is a serious transformation to what that was. Uh, and so I want to say welcome and I look forward to hearing your, your resilience. That's right. Thanks, B. I appreciate it. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to sit in this chair. I'm animated about mine. Uh, my name is Marcus Sanders. I'm also a returning citizen. I did approximately 20 years on an installment plan, you know? So uh, my last time, I did 10 years, a decade, and just realizing that um, the topic today, building resilience for a purpose. And the thing about most of us understanding that's in these streets so there's been this game, we have to have a purpose on why we do a lot of stuff. And the majority of the times it's because it's right there, it's just accessible. You know what I mean? You find yourself doing things of unimaginable things for no real purpose when you think about it because it's, it's like the end result is okay, you're looking for that fast buck and you're gonna spend it just as quick as you got it. You know what I mean? So. Um, on my journey, I ran into a, quite a few interesting people. The main was, I think I was gone for like seven years. I've been down for like seven years. I was doing, I was gonna do 10 straight. So I'm, I've been down like seven years. I'm in the fire department. I worked for a Cal Fire. And um, I worked in the, um, I was in the back as a um, McLeod, just doing McLeod. Next thing you know, I'm the guy in the front with the medical pack and everything. I'm making sure we get where we gotta go and we'll make sure you get back safely. You know what I mean? So. Me being able to transition in the mindset, because I'm on the yard, everybody's running around doing their thing, but I'm running the track every day. I'm preparing myself to get to fire camp. When all the rest of the guys just sitting in there, they like, oh man, man, you really going to fire camp? Yeah, man, I need to make it better for my wife and my kids when they come see me. You know, so it allowed me to start thinking about other people. You know what I mean? But it's, it's, it's a continuous. Most of the lifers that come home, they didn't put some work in to get them. Most of the cats that's getting out, that just got a, a date, they ain't prepared to be free. They think, they, because they already know when they're getting home. Brian ain't know when he was getting home. He didn't have, he didn't got denied five times. I would have broke up in pieces. You know what I mean? But he stood his ground and held his business. But the majority of the cats that go do time, they are, they have a set date. So all he could do is like, okay, man, on this day, he preparing. Oh, I'm getting out on this day. Whoop, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go pop bottles. We're going to go see the girls. We finna do all of it. You forgot to see, put your mama on there. You need to go see the people that took care of you, the people that supported you. You know what I mean? And just allowing yourself to have that acknowledgement that other people really exist. Because most of us don't. And it's not out of harshness. It's just, a, it's just like us being desensitized to... Somebody getting killed. If you've been to 35 funerals, you really not, it don't, oh man, what's the nigga got killed? Oh man, man, maybe you should have got out the way. You know what I mean? 
then Brian know a lot of our stories, so he's aware of it. But in his actual, just like, okay, my family or my cousins or something like that, he's not going to no funeral every other week or waiting for a phone call to said the, the child and got killed in the middle of the night coming from a party. You know what I mean? So we get desensitized about a lot of things, which is allows us to not care. To the average human being, it's like, oh, they don't care. We don't care. No, because that trauma is, ooh, that trauma is, you have to fight that trauma. Some people are going to be drugs. It's going to be alcohol. It might just be, I'm going to take my life because I can't deal with it no more. You know, so it's a lot of the trauma is, is totally, it's over the charts. You know what I mean? But for me, my journey, um, my brother had died. It took me 32 years to realize why, how I went to prison. And it took me 32 years to me to realize with the group we in that, man, how do, I know I got, went to prison. I know what I went for. But then I was like, how did I get there? It took me 32 years to figure it out. My brother died. My little brother, my, my little brother died. His twin, uh -uh, one of, he had a twin. And that's what triggered me. But it took me 32 years to realize that's what happened. That's how deep this trauma is, you know what I mean? And then for us, it's like, a, um, it's a masculine thing. The man don't, oh, we ain't, we soft. It's like if you got a little girl, you got a daughter. When she little, if she fall down, hurt her leg, oh, baby, you okay? My baby is okay? Your son fall down, man, get up. Stop all that crying, wipe yourself off. You know what I mean? So we talk from a young age to be them type of people. And a lot of cats is taking that on to be that person when you really need to just be trying to find out exactly who you is. Now, we're talking about resilience for a purpose. It's a lot of people don't have no purpose in their life. And it's not a bad thing. You know what I mean? We ain't got, it ain't a million Bill Gates running around. You know, everybody have a purpose. But your purpose just might be just to live the end and just keep moving along and making sure the wife and kids are not causing chaos and all that type of thing. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of people want to be bigger than what they is. It's like fit in your lane. When they say stay in your lane, some people could take it negative. Oh, they want to, no, man, it's just, it's really trying to just give you the, um, the past to just be you. It's all right to be you. You know what I mean? But I come from a place where us being uh, returning citizens, okay, we got that strike right there. Then I come from the streets. So I still got that strike right there. I got to deal with both of them at all times. This is who made me who I am. This is, they know who I am. I'm trying to figure with them, but I'm trying to get in the middle so I can be a, I just want to be a person because the street's going to remember me for what I've done. So now I'm like, I don't want to be dragged back into that, but I'm also not going to let you do nothing to me. So I'm going to move, remove my family and everybody else away from the things, you know, but now it took this for RCA to come in my life to say, I need to go. I need to do some, I need to put some work in. You know what I mean? So it allowed me to be at a, Running the Bia, Ramon, all these people that I have respected and know who they are. It's like you respect him, so you know it's got to be something going on over there. It's got to be something going on, because he just ain't finna do no anything. We know he, he funny acting, so you know he ain't finna just do no anything. So I'm like, something going on over there. We're beating them at BC me. He's like, okay, Ramon see me. We like, oh man, something up here. We finna make something happen out of this. And this story need to be told, because it's a lot of lifers coming out. They have to put so much work in. But it's different out here. My wife would tell you, I was gone for 10 years. I, came, I left in 95, came home in 2005. And I think I know everything. It's going to be great when I go. This, I can't wait to. This is that guy that, that got me in there. This is his thinking. He, he talking slick and all this stuff to my wife. And, I'm going to make something happen. Like, nah. And I got out, disappointed my whole family. Wife, kids, grandkids, everybody. You know, I'm there, I'm, I'm there, but I'm not there. Because I, don't, I didn't take the chance to say, let my wife lead me where I need to go. Because she's been out, she's been, she been free all this time. I ain't been free. She know exactly what you're doing. And most men won't let their woman lead for no specific reason. Like, she ain't going to teach, she ain't going to show you nothing wrong. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of different moves that they got, we got to deal with sitting up in themselves and coming home and be able to uh, apply ourselves correctly to life. But I got a, two stories. I was, um, this, is, this is a resilient story. I was in fire camp. I've been down like seven years. And uh, I'm working at the um, fairgrounds in uh, Orville, I mean, where was we at? In Corning, California. 
And um, I'm helping the FFA, the kids, getting all their stuff together. And, we, and it's a woman. She's like, I need your help. Oh, no problem. I'm in a, she know I'm an inmate. And I'm like, whoop, I'm helping her. You know what I mean? I got the crew doing their thing. I'm coordinating everybody because now I'm the guy in the front. You know what I mean? I'm the guy in the front. So I got responsibility. These cats' life is on the line because he, the captain in the front, I'm in the back. I'm, I'm the eyes and ears of what's moving too. So this is giving me responsibility in this field as far as regular life. You know what I mean? As far as on what responsible people do. You know what I mean? I've never had to be responsible in my life. I didn't pay a bill until 2005 in my life. I had a beeper bill, so you know where I come from. That's it. I ain't never paid a bill in my life. But I get home, I got a whole family. I got five kids, wife, my little brother there, my nephew there, and I'm taking on all this and ain't never had a, I ain't had a responsible bone in my body. But I think I can do this. This is one thing about us. We get out of that place, our mindsets are totally different. Our crimes let you know we're totally different. You know what I mean? As far as on, we think big. We think big. And we like, we have so much faith in ourselves, it allows us to make these power moves. We, I know he had an enemy, but damn, I didn't know he was going to do that. We got it in us. That's why we, the energy and the understanding that we have amongst each other, a lot, it feeds each one of us. Like we have our mental health on Sunday. We come up out of that meeting like, oh, yeah, I'm ready. I went in there, broke up, like, oh, dragged myself to the meeting, like, help. You know, it's mental help. We're trying to figure each other out, so therefore we can stand back up and say, man, we get back in the game. We got this. You know, this is what RCA has done for me. My wife and my sister tell you, like, ever since you've been rocking with RCA, you, you different. But it was always in me. I've been free for 18 years. You know what I mean? But I've been out here by myself, and I'm not where I live. I'm from Pittsburgh. You know what I mean? We're about to pee. But I live in Oroville on seven acres, just peace and quiet. You can get in trouble up there, too. Don't get me wrong. You know, but it's mindset. I need that peace of understanding. When I come to Pittsburgh, they're like, is that him? And I'm in and out, and they're like, bro, was you out here? Nope. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you got going on. I'm not better than you, but I'm still I'm trying to live. You know what I mean? But, you know, I'm going to jump all over the place. But my story was I'm, FF, I'm in the FF, uh, um, dealing with the kids with the FFA. The lady like, I need your help. I'm like, I got you. So I'm getting all her stuff together. Her husband's watching me. He like this. He like, hey, you want a real job when you get out? Yeah. Son, he said, well, you ain't gonna be doing what you was doing when you got in. Got yourself in there. The tongue can say anything. Yep, I ain't gonna be doing none of that. You know what I mean? So he like, uh, all right, take my information. He wasn't supposed to give me his information. I had three more years left. Do you know when I got out of prison? This also is why we, we love the system, but it's pieces within the system that be messing stuff up. Now you spent, I, I got 5,000 hours on the fire, actual fire line. I done been to LA, back burning with horses running on fire through the, in 2003, I'm there. I'm one of the first catchers on the scene. So I know what I'm doing. So when I get out, I go to the fire department. Fire department like, oh yeah, we need you. Go take a test up and me and my wife go to Humboldt. Whoop, they like, yeah, oh, we need you. Um, uh, what's the name of that? It's another uh, federal fire department inside of, uh, inside of um, in Chico. Firestorm, matter of fact, it's called Firestorm. They like, oh yeah, we want you. Go to the parole office. You just spent all this money teaching me to be a firefighter. The state just spent all that money. For sure, as soon as I went up in that parole office, she said, yeah. Nah, you ain't gonna be no firefighter. You can work at McDonald's. Your wife made good money. Right in front of my wife and my kids. I'm like, but that, that not well seasoned person instantly flip out. Send me back to the bay. Now that other guy that got me in there, he didn't popped out. Hey man, yeah, I need to send me back to the bay, understand me? So I, I made some, I was gone within a week. I've been gone 10 years from my wife and my kids. Now I'm back in the Bay where every, I know every nook and cranny, everything to get in trouble in. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm miserable. I'm drinking and driving. I'm driving 200 miles with a fifth in my lap. I'm so miserable, I need to go see my wife and my kids. I catch three DUIs. I bought my first house, catch three DUIs going back and forth to Chico from Pittsburgh. 
Got a good job. As a matter of fact, the, the, the guy got me in the union. I was in local uh, um, 152 Martinez. I'm a carpenter to this day. And, um, so I'm like, um, three DUIs in a row. My wife is devastated. Just did a decade. I just did a decade. Coming home talking all the slick shit you want to hear. I'm talking that talk. And I'm walking it a little bit, but I'm, I'm just crawling. I, don't, I ain't stood up yet because I ain't never had to. You know what I mean? And then she told me, if you love me the way you love me, how you keep leaving us and going to jail? And I'm like, I could never figure it out. And I was like, hmm. I said, you know I love my sister and my brother. She said, yeah, you love your sister and brothers more than anything. I said, you know I love my sister and brothers. So you think I just, just woke up today, I'm going to hurt my brothers and my sisters? My, my, my sister and my brothers were like, no, that ain't what we're doing. I said, it's choices. So after that third DUI, Never did it again. I was free. I've been free 18 years. You know what I mean? But the purpose for me was that I didn't want to see that pain that I'm seeing on my wife's face or my kids. My sister wasn't going to show nothing. She just like, okay, my brother been going back for it to the pen since he was a juvenile. You know, since he's a juvenile, huh? you know, he might last for 90 days. You know what I mean? He might, he might be able to uh, stay out for 120 since I was like 11. I'm 55 years old, finna be 56. I got 14 grandchildren and six kids. So I've never been dependable. They, she ain't expect me to be dependable yet. He been doing this for years. But my wife, I didn't drug my wife and my kids into this. Now I'm affecting people. All your moves, you may think understand me that quick dollar, that move you busting, oh, they shining like new money. But sooner or later, you're going to get knocked off that, that pedestal. And they're going to have to pay the tax for it. You know what I mean? So us being, this is my guy that we trying to continue to be dependable people. Dependable people. I had an amazing time. Uh, I've been going around seeing my grandkids. It's graduation. You know, I just came from Atlanta. I'm looking at uh, um, Washington, D.C. My niece just graduated from Howard. I helped point up be a part of that. I'm watching it. I'm watching it shine right in front of me. I'm seeing my other nieces and them doing their thing, my grandkids. Now, I go to, um, me and my wife go see one of my grandbabies. She's going from elementary. Uh, uh, she's going to first grade as soon as I walk in the building. That's my papa. There's my papa. She tell the whole classroom. My wife just looked at like, what about me? He's like, papa right there. You know what I mean? She's like, that's papa. I'm walking out the room all of here. That's my papa. That's my dad's dad. You know what I mean? So it's like those type of moments, man, you can't buy them from nowhere. And I'm like, being a returning citizen, I know what certain people think, but it's like, you don't know me, but I'm not going to take it as what's that? You, I put that tag on myself. We put this tag, this tag on ourselves, and then get mad when a mother look at the tag like, yeah, man, yeah, that's you. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's all you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Man, that ain't me. Uh-uh. You did that six times. Oh, 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 that's you. But it's always time for change. You know what I mean? But you have to be around people that inspire you to change that just like you. I could talk to B about anything. I could talk to Ramon about anything because he understands my struggle. You know what I mean? This is the key for all of us to continue to have these connections, which helps society. You got, it's 100 terrorists off the, off the, <laughs> off the list. You know what I mean? We didn't drop the recidivism rate because we out here. And then we making sure our kids don't have to participate in none of that. And all the guys that we didn't ran into in our whole life that look up to us, because I'm not, I don't have, oh, that's the big homeboy. I am the big homeboy. You know what I mean? I am the beginning of what I'm talking about. So now only what I can show you, I got to show it to you. So when you see me, you like, oh, it's possible. Look at the big homie, the one you respect so much for all the, the weird stuff. And you didn't gave me cases, I ain't, it ain't even me, but it could be whatever you want it to be because that's your story. You know what I mean? And it just, it, it amazes me that you still see people that you grew up with and they like, they ain't moved. I'm not better than you, but in a sense I am better than you because I got my shit together because I got a purpose. I got people depending on me. You got people depending on you too. You know what I mean? But you choose not to do nothing about it. We choose to do something about it. That's why RCA is what it is today. We choose to do something about it. And then we like, okay, well, what do you think? What do you think? And we have this dialogue which allows all of us to be able to say, okay, 
Okay, you can move the cheers. Okay, you know how to fix the engine. Okay, you know how to draw the map. We putting all these pieces together and we gonna make something happen. Do you know what I mean? And the resilience for me was being able to see my wife come home from work and I maybe just be in my chair with my feet kicked up, but I've been in that chair for 18 years. So <laughs> I know damn well he gonna be right there. You know what I mean? So, and my grandkids seeing me. I had one just graduated yesterday. All the love. When she getting into school, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm there before them. She drive up. I got flowers and everything. She look at the one like, Papa here before school start. Yeah. I'm that guy. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy now. You know what I mean? I'm that guy now. And that guy is going to allow society to be able to say, okay, I'm going to get this guy a chance. I'm going to get this guy a chance. Okay, I'm, if B brought somebody to me and said, man, this is my friend. I know who he is, so I'm going to take his word for what it is because it's, it's on him, and he know what type of person I am. It's like having that camaraderie, and it allows different energy and the good people. Now I'm in circles I ain't never been in. I'm like, man, I got 90-year-old partners. I just went to a, what we went to, Mom? We went to uh, Ducks Unlimited. That's guns and Budweiser. <laughs> and I'm the only thing that looked like me in there, but they was loving me. I'm at the main table, my partner, the chairman. They're like, who is him? They're like, who is this dude? He got to be somebody. <laughs> they like, man, I'm through that. Everybody, hey. Hey, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm in there with the looking for information. How are they doing their fundraisers? How are they doing that? How did they get that done? And I'm my guy, he telling me, but I'm getting to see it in action. Back to RCA table. Hey man, they over there doing woo -doo -woo -doo -woo -woo. I think we can make a shake. You know what I mean? <laughs> Everything is about information. You obtain it, you use it, or you discharge it. You know what I mean? And we're going to continue to have this dialogue with ourselves because the main thing about anybody in jail, out of jail, victims, family members, that individual has to have it. We could tell them 9, 10, 1,300 times. If they don't have a conversation with themselves, the change is never going to take place. And that was the main thing. I got to do this for my wife and my kids and my kids. And I'm like, I'm doing it. But then I'm like, I'm doing it for them. I'm like, but I'm still trying to be me. Oh, you ain't ready to change. That's why your life is, is just moving in circles. Boom, then the change took place. Now I'm standing upright because I'm standing on business. As these youngsters, I'm standing on business because I can talk about what I'm doing because I'm walking it. And then my brothers allow me to be able to continue to talk it and walk it because I got, I'm held accountable to them too. You know what I mean? I can't be over there. Uh, we just got off to do the right thing. And I got 10 keys in the trunk. All right, man, I'll see y'all later, man. I'm gonna go bust a move. <laughs> no, man, because the game gonna check you sooner or later. The game we live by, which is the game of life. You can't keep doing that wrong. I'm not no better than anybody. But I didn't travel some places you, you could never make it out of. I'm well respected from the streets to the walls. You know what my thing is that I'm just trying to get the information and the people around me to keep me up upright. Because it don't take nothing but 10 seconds to just blow it off. And life is a trial every day. Every day something going on. You can involve yourself in it or not. Now I knew I changed. I had, it was a, wasn't, it was a funny day. It was, it was a sad day, but it was funny. We on the freeway going to Sacramento. One of my aunties just passed. I got my older my auntie in the, in the passenger seat and my, my little cousin in the back. I'm riding, we in Sacramento. Boom, I see the explosion in front of me. Somebody hit the divider and all I see is water. I'm like, ooh, I hope ain't nobody dead in that car. I'm worried about somebody else. I've never been worried about nobody in my life, mm -hmm. except for my folks that's moving with me, doing all the criminal stuff. And when you go to jail, you, you can't get a phone call. You, you ain't getting no visit. You can't get a package. You can't do none of that. But you run right back to them weirdos as soon as you get out. Them my folks. <laughs> no, they ain't my folks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So I'm driving around the what's the name, and I see I, the, the car was in front of me, one in front. And I see the car flipped over. I'm like, man, I say, TT, I need to pull over. I got to see if they need help. Whoop, pull right over, jump right out of my truck. Whoop, went over there. The little Pujami caddy, he had him straight in his head. And I pulled him out. I'm like, man, you OK? Is anybody else in there? He's like, no. You know what I mean? So I help him get to the side. Boom, I'm like, man, just sit down. 
We'll run back to my truck. I got, I ain't never had a flare in my life. I, I got flares and everything in my truck. I'm like this, I'm putting flares all in the street everywhere. You know what I mean? It's because of the person I have become. That I'm, and then what, so the craziest thing, I'm telling my auntie like, man, look at this. I said, oh me, I just kept on pushing. Hope it work out for him, just keep on rolling. I get to the funeral, my cousin, I'm like, me, he said, man, you see the accident on the freeway? He said, yeah, man, I had time for none of that. I kept on pushing. <laughs> I said, I, you didn't see me, I was out there helping the people. You know what I mean? But I can understand because whatever you think that you had going on was more important than what you saw right there. Okay, TT, she gone already. So it's like, you ain't gonna be late to her funeral. You know what I mean? I'm like, we trying to help somebody. But it comes with you be able to have some compassion. Us in the street, we ain't got no compassion because if we do, we wouldn't do none of the shit we do. Right. It ain't that I'm just ruthless and gutted. Uh, I hate the world. Like, no, man, I'm out of getting money. I can't be soft about nothing. I'm gonna do what I do. Because if we think, we some very, we think, we know you shouldn't be doing that. Okay, but my baby need to eat. I got my car payment you need to get done. I need to get, you know, these are all the things we justify on why we do the things we do. But the end result is you gonna be, you didn't had, you didn't got the car, you didn't got the house, you got the girl, maybe got two, three of them. But as soon as they get your ass, it's over. <laughs> you done left the wife and kids, now they came and paid the rent. You done got the nice house, they came and paid the mortgage. The car gone. You were, you, now you's a, um, what I'd say, what's the name? You a liability. And you a liability for years to years and years and years and years. We just have to start thinking about other people, which allows us to be able to. We say we want them blessings to come your way, man. Open the door for it to happen. You want to take, 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 but you ain't got, you ain't willing to give nothing. Not even your time. Because it only takes, I could be up here talking and I could say one word, boom, that could turn anybody off. Now you ain't listening no more. But the truth is the truth. I'm just telling you my story. And I got plenty of them. But it's my story, you know what I mean? And it's something that continues to be relevant to this day. It's like we are, the times that these kids are living in, the times that we're seeing all this thing going on, we know we can help because I traveled that road. I've been down there. I know exactly what you're going to do. It's like I tell my kids, what I look like wake up in the morning, I'm going to tell you something wrong. Man, I'm trying, I want you to win. I want you to win. Oh, he think he's doing something. Why is the competition? You know, it's like the, the competition is not healthy in certain aspects. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, let's be a competition. How many donation slips did you get this week, man? You know what I mean? Let's go get this money like that. You know, so then we can help the kids. Then we can come back to the to the to the neighborhoods and be like, man, oh, is that Ramon them? What they got going on? And their mothers and grandmothers would be like, I know that boy. That boy was a terrible when he was a youngster, but look at him now. Yeah, you better send them kids with them boys. They know what they're talking about. They was respected in the game and not for no violence and all that old type of stuff. We're just talking about just respectable cats that's in this field. Like, you, you um, you's a doctor? It's other doctors you don't respect. Like, man, he's a weirdo. You know what I mean? And then it's some like, hey, man, he's, he's a good doctor. You know what I mean? He's real good with what he's doing. He's he compassionate about his, um, his, uh, uh, um, Patients. Most doctors ain't compassionate about patients no more, man. It's a, hey, man. Bring them in there. Bring them in there. All right. Uh, hey, Mr. Johnson, you take care of that. Room to room, like these stalls they got, and you can go into each one. Boop, 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 boop. Usually you better sit down and have a conversation with your daughter. He, I mean, with your doctor, you get a chance to know who you is. Them days is gone. So that just tell you everything we living in is now as a time of right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. But we got to take the time, man, slow down and then be like, okay. What do you really appreciate? What is your purpose? My main thing for me, man, it may sound cliche. Man, I, as long as I wake up in the morning, man, I'm going to be all right. Because then I can do what I want to do. Even if I don't do it, I woke up. So I got the opportunity to make some shape. We're going to stay getting stuff through our way. They're going to be dropping bombs on us. Life is going to keep lifing. But it's how you deal with it. And if you got collective, you got good people around you, those are the tools you need. Because you don't, if you had all the answers, then <laughs> we wouldn't need nobody. But we need good people around us, man. We need good programs that's going to be able to help these kids. Even if you don't got a kid that's in, been in trouble, whatever. I guarantee you know somebody is. 
I guarantee you in them schools, it's one cat or two that you can get to, and he can, he can drain the whole train where exactly where you want him to go. You just got to get to that one kid. It's, not, it's one kid. One or two when you're in school, in high school, it's always that a junior high, the, the cool kid, the bully kid. Uh, all you do is get to that one kid. You focus on him. And everything that he touched is going to fall right where you want it to lay. You know, this is the information in the game to understand that we know that what we got to do when we deal with these kids. My main goal is to get up in these schools, get up in these jails, because it's a bunch of cats, all, like, you know, criminals. <laughs> We're going to call it what it is. They just happen to be the homeboys or look like you. But y'all lying to yourself, y'all having that conversation with yourself that you're not telling nobody. Ain't no way you sitting up in this bathroom you call a sale and you in there for 10, 15 years and you all right. Nah. That don't even make sense. You didn't want to be in the bathroom at your own house where you didn't use the bathroom and trying to get up out of there. You, man, spray some shit, you know what I mean? You, nah, and you living in there for 10 years straight with another dude. It, 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 that's trauma on a whole nother level. But we suppress everything and we like, yeah, I'm straight. You don't, but you wouldn't tell. You know what I mean? I, I, my life ain't great. I'm free, but it's, it's, it's hard out here. <laughs> the mortgages, and you know, the life you want to live and what you're supposed to do. Ain't nobody say, man, I two jobs. Man. Then you come home and your wife got attitude. Like, man, just, uh, you know, it's just life. You know what I mean? But we can have these conversations with each other so it allows us to be like, man, I ain't the only one going through this. This is crazy. Man, she's getting on my nerves. You know what I mean? Mine too. But hey, man. Hey, baby, how you doing? Oh, hey, great. Ooh, I need to just Sunday meeting need to come. I, it's just, she killing me right now. You know what I mean? But it's just life. You know what I mean? But we are, we are equipped with this information we try to give to all our people that surround us so they be successful because we know exactly, we don't want you going down the road, but we, we know how life, we really get a chance to analyze life. All we do is think. For my wife, I sit in my chair for hours and just be, my brain running 100 miles an hour because there's so many different things that we, we want to be a part of, so many different things we saw. Uh, we got grandchildren. Oh, this one acted crazy at junior high. I got to deal with that one. Okay, this one got a graduation. Boop, oh, how's my niece? You know, I hope my brother's okay. You know what I mean? We want all our people to okay. You know, but it's like certain things you have to let go. I used to be so angry with my brother, my oldest brother, smartest. I'm talking about he's smart. He's smart, smart. But he should be doing better than what he's doing. Not saying we better than nobody, but I know you better because everything that I'm doing, I do today, you taught me how to do it, and you're not doing none of it, so I'm very disappointed. I'm hurt. You know what I mean? And then my mama died, and she's like, you take care of your brother. I said to myself, yeah, man, I don't even like this dude, but it, okay. <laughs> but, the, but the burden was lifted off of me because I had a conversation with myself, and I was like, hey, you know what? Hey, man, you're going to do what you do. As long as you breathing, I'm fine. And it was like, I don't feel, I don't feel that, no pain, no nothing, because he used to just, I used to, you know, rage. Only your siblings can get you that mad. It ain't your wife or your friend, now. it's your siblings that can do it to you. You know what I mean? So it's like, the resilience for me is to continue to stay on the path that I'm on. It's not easy, you know what I mean? But I'm surrounded by some good people, and I'm meeting more new people, which allows me be, to be able to, Oh, you got your hand? You waving your hand? All right, let me take it. We got a question. Uh, okay. Oh, it's county? Oh, you count. I'm sorry to hear about that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> my sister. <laughs> See, I, I, I was a criminal. My sister worked for the, the, the police department. You know, a 911 operator. My other brother is a security guard. He keeps a gun. <laughs> and I'm over here just like, yeah, I want to be the criminal. I want to be that guy to go to jail and sit up in the bathroom for 10 years straight. Yeah, man, or take, suck the life out of my wife and kids because I need a package, because I need a TV. You know, I wanted, they, they wasn't paying, they, you had to pay for phone calls back then. For sure, my wife, probably 10 years, she probably spent about $40,000 in phone bills. You know what I mean? 
it affects the family way more because we think we can handle it. We just deal with the trauma as men. But our family, we didn't sit, you didn't, you didn't messed up that relationship that you thought you had from the beginning because there's some pain over there and the conversations are not being had. And then us, we don't want to hear no conversations like, hey, man. We try to talk as less as possible because you really don't want to hear the conversation. Unfortunately, we might hurt your feelings with the truth. You know what I mean? They be saying they want to hear the truth, but you don't want to hear my truth. You know what I mean? And we at the point now where it's though, it's going to be so vicious, not intentionally at you, but it's going to be raw. And most people don't, they're not ready to hear them conversations we have because it's not attacked or nothing. It's really what it is. Every time we serve you something, it's according to the level that you own. Not saying we better than you, but the level you own where you can really understand it because it only takes one or two words for us to not listen no more. Words are powerful. When you say what you say out your mouth, make sure it has an impact and it allows somebody else to be a better person after you finish talking to them. And this is what it's about for me. My journey continues and I'm gonna continue to do what I do. And um, thank you guys for coming out. And you know, our main slogan is, um, like the brother said, social, economical, and political capital. Because if you're not in them rooms, you can't make an impact. How you, in, how you in, the, in the room talking about me and I'm not sitting at the table? Nothing about us without us is the key. We need to sit at the table. I don't care if it's a room of 100 people. We got two of our people up in there trying to give us, understand me, the insight on what we talking about. Because if you're not listening to none of us, understand me, you're not going to be able to understand where we coming from. You know what I mean? Because we need both sides in order to say, okay, this is what citizens think. This is what... The, 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 he always gonna be a criminal according to the system. But I'm a citizen, I'm a, I'm a returning citizen. I went away on vacation, but I'm back to be the citizen that I'm supposed to be and I can show you what I can tell you. You know what I mean? And that's where we at with it, you know what I mean? And yeah, I can, you know, I'll go on and go on and go on. <laughs> but uh, I gotta leave the stage for my folks. Um, I appreciate you coming out, I appreciate any support. Even if it's just the words you got away from it and allowed you to be able to be able to take it back and say, hmm, I never looked at it like that. Because I'm learning every day. I got 90-year-old friends, 80, 82, and it just, it, I just be sitting in the table learning so much information. They don't look like me, but they love me to death. They want me to win. They want me to win. And I'm just sitting there just sucking up the information. In the compassion, I'm going to tell you one more story. I had a partner, you know, I, play, I used to play poker for a living, professional poker. That's what I did when I got out of penitentiary. I played poker, and I played, uh, um, I, um, I was a carpenter. But I got hurt, I fell off the bridge out there in Tracy, snapped my whole left side. So I was like, okay, bam, I don't wanna do that, I don't wanna be on no bridges no more. So <laughs> I started playing poker, you know what I mean? And I, I got good at it. I learned in the pen, you know what I mean? And you got your noodles took, but then you came home and then you started getting some bread. So I'm paying mortgages and everything off of poker. I'm meeting some interesting people. I'm not down here, I'm somewhere else. And I'm like, uh, it, so we became friends. Then my partner, he just passed like two weeks ago, but uh, it was like he's sick. He like 79, he, used to, he was in, uh, uh, in the war, he do electronics and all that type of stuff. So basically he was basically probably a spy or something way out in Germany at that time, you know what I mean? But we have a little conversation, so I'm going over to visit him, I'm like, man, what's going on, man? He holler, man. Yeah, it's over. I said, what? Because he was, you know, when stem cell first came out, he had the money for half a million dollars for all, all the stuff. He way in Florida and everything. And he's like, yeah, man, I did all that, man. It didn't work. He said, but you know what, Marcus? It's quality of life, Marcus. It's not quantity. I can give me a dialysis machine and put it right there and go get, get hooked up three times a day. He said, but how's that? What would I look like living like that? And I was just like, man, this cat... Ain't afraid to die. He know he finna die. And he's like, hey, man, I live my life. I'm good. It's like the old people say, you live your life. I don't live mine. But just being around that, that confidence about how, like, man, I've done the great, I've done the best I can do. And my kids, just, they, where they at, no matter what kind of relationships they, they got with they self, I know I've done my job. You know what I mean? So I said he loved poker. I said, so you know what? I'm going to bring poker to your house. This was in December. He couldn't even walk, he was bedridden. He just died a couple of weeks ago. He was walking, talking, everything. Oh, we go see him every Tuesday, sit there and play poker. 
I'm taking all the money anyway. We plan for quarters. I, I came over. My wife said, you're just over there just taking the money. Yeah. This is what we do. We play poker. You know what I mean? I'm not going to take a light on y'all. Y'all know this is what we do. You know what I mean? I'm pot I got jars of quarters. You know what I mean? But I said that to say that, man, when he passed, his wife sent me a text to say, Marcus, you are so amazing. Do you know you made the last five months of his life something? Because he, he was like, man, I die on the poker table right now. I'm doing what I love doing. And I made it a point every Tuesday to be that person that is going to pop up and he can see my face and be like, what's up, Marcus? Hey, how you doing? Wife cooking, making sure we good up in there. But it was that I've been able to give something to somebody else that they, I know that they needed. You know what I mean? And it makes you start feeling good about yourself because I can't do my past. I know what's in front of me. I know I got a left. My wife always say choice. No, nah, I don't have no choice. Yeah, you do. Like, no, nah, you know, I don't got no choice. I got to do it. And the wife say do something and such. You don't have to do it, though. Yeah, it's consequences come with that. That's just a life. So it's like you got a choice, man. Choose the right path because you're going to pay. It's guaranteed you're going to pay. I don't know successful dope dealers, successful murderers. I don't know none of them. And I know some cats still got some money from back in the days, but they didn't went to prison. You know what I mean? They done lost a lot of stuff on the way. There's no reason for it. The working guy has the same shit. He, he going to keep it. Man. He going to go to work. What? That new, that whatever car they driving, the fast ones with the Hawks or something. You go, SRT. yeah, SRTs, all them nice cars. You see these cats, and like, man, that's a nice car. But he going to keep his. You done stole yours or they you, you behind <laughs> two payments or some shit. You know what I mean? Or you didn't bust a move, and then next you know you get whacked and you can't pay the bill. Oh, you got your wife, your, your girlfriend got the new whip, we got all that. But when you got a job, man, for sure, man, go and sign your life away on the paper. Let me just sign it instead of, <laughs> instead of going away for life. Let me just sign this piece of paper and figure it out. You know what I mean? And it was beautiful, man, just to be able to say, I'm a homeowner. You know what I mean? All right, my sister, uh, my wife and my sister. But I want to say that I'm a carpenter. Uh, I've been a carpenter since uh, 2005 when I got out. Um, I'm still an apprentice. I'm an 18 year apprentice too, bro. Every time I go to school, they be like, you've been an apprentice for 18 years? Yep. That's all right. Hey, you know, but I'm still in it. You know what I mean? And um, I'm a homeowner. I got seven acres. I got 14 grandchildren. I got six kids. I got some wonderful friends, and my life is just beginning. It's never that it's too late. Nah, man, as long as you wake up, man, there's something good going to come your way. You know what I mean? And I thank you guys for coming out, and, you know, we're going to do what we do. It could be one person that's wrong. I'm going to still be that guy. Because, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I wanted to say, I wanted to say one more thing. Our, um, we are the mentor's mentor. Because we've been there. We've done it already. So the cat, that's why we had these conversations with each other, so we could just keep staying sharp and stay doing what we're doing. We the mentor's mentor. And that's what I wanted to end with. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, as you know, Mark, Marcus is uh, full of experiences. <laughs> and uh, and he's, he's such a joy to be around because he does absolutely uplift the group and everyone that he comes into contact with. So he's a, he's a powerful person, not only uh, socially, but also personally. So thank you, Marcus, for, for your insight. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you. Sure. Um, but I wanted to talk about something really quick about like resilience for a purpose, you know? When we talk about resilience for a purpose, it reminds me of this guy named Charlie Plum. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Charlie Plum, but Charlie Plum's a Vietnam veteran. Charlie Plum was uh, captured POW. And at the Hotel Hanoi, um, Charlie Plum and, and several other servicemen were, you know, going through this terrible experience. One of the, one of the uh, POWs was a seaman that happened to fall off a ship. Charlie Plum was a, was a pilot. And when the seaman came in, all he did was ask everyone what their name was. But they had, to, they had to be secretive. They had to pass notes, you know. They passed notes to one another. And the seaman wanted to know everyone's name, where they came from, family members, date of birth, etc. 
So he was resilient for a purpose. Because what his purpose was, was when he was, if he ever went home, he was going to go to each and every family member to make sure that they were aware of their, you know, their, their, while they were in, in term, or what do you call it, internment camp? I don't, I'm not sure what it is. Um. Yeah, so when they're in a prisoner of war camp, um, that, you know, he was going to let them know that he was with their, with their loved one. And ultimately, John McCain came in. And uh, John McCain, you know, was, was the maverick. And John McCain was one of the persons who they were going to use as a political prisoner, and they were going to release him, you know, but he said no. I am not going to go until everyone else goes before me. So when I say that, that everyone has a, a, you know, a purpose in life, what the resilience is, there's, there's people that have tremendous stories of like what they personally experienced. And, and the people on this panel have experienced some resilience of, of what it was like to be in that eight by eight cell of living with another person and, and not knowing what that future may hold. Uh, but I want to say thank you for, for your stories and, uh, and, and thank you for everyone here. And we're going to continue. Um, I'd like to, um, you know, give a warm welcome to Nina Clark. Um, Is it Clark? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I looked back down. I had to make sure. Oh, my, oh my gosh. God. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Nina has, has, has served as a community lia uh, liaison for RCA now for more than ten, uh, two years. Her commitment to bridging the gap between the system impacted and community have been so valuable to our organization. Uh, she has been with us since day one, our first and original founding member. Nina is a dedicated mental health professional with over two decades of experience working with homeless uh, and mentally ill populations. Uh, she has um, overcome her own personal challenges, uh, coming out stronger and more compassionate. She's driven by a desire to empower others. And uh, thank you, Nina, for having the courage to be here with us, sharing your thoughts on having resilience for a purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. He, he was saying all that. I'm like, who is he talking about? <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, and it's hard to follow Marcus, but I, I'm going to do my best. So my name is Nina Clark. Um, I'm originally, I'm from Oakland, but I live in San Pablo now because Oakland just ain't Oakland anymore. I'm the old school Oakland, like when Oakland was good. So um, we grew up, um, I grew up, it was three boys, three girls. They called us the Black Brady Bunch. And yes, I do have a brother named Greg. And I, had, <laughs> and I have a brother named Peter, but sadly he succumbed to cancer at a young age. Now I'm gonna tell this story and I might get a little teary eyed, but I'll be okay. okay. I'll be okay, because I can tell so many stories, but I think I'm gonna focus more on domestic, domestic violence. Maybe I, I can help somebody, even if it's a man, because then you can see our perspective on what we go through and people always say, why didn't you leave, why didn't you leave? Well, it's not that easy, so I'll focus on that. But I'll start from a young age. We grew up in a great neighborhood. We stayed not too far from Laney College in Oakland by the Oakland Museum. We used to go down there and play with guppies and just have fun. It was so fun and all the kids would come to our neighborhood because it was most, we had the most kids in our family. So, um, you know, it was Asian, it was white, it was black, and so it was very diverse, and, and we loved it. I loved it. And, um, you know, earlier on, um, I, I didn't grow up with my dad because I didn't meet him until I was 18. So I was, you know, I, and when I hit teenager, I, was, I started being boy crazy. I, I'm not going to lie, I did. And now that I look back on it, I'm like, oh my God, why didn't, 
somebody, I needed a mentor or something. But anyway, I got into boys <clears throat> and I had a boyfriend and um, it was cool at first, but then he started being very possessive. And at that time, I didn't know what red flags were. You know, I was a teenager, I didn't know. They didn't talk about red flags in class or none of that. So, um, you know, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my brothers because I knew that I would probably be back with them the next day. So that went on for a while. And, um, you know, karma, you know, this guy, um, he ends up getting shot and his legs got cut off or one of his legs got cut off. And, um, you know, I went to see him in the hospital still. But by that time, you know, my mother... Um, she, um, we, lived in a, we lived in a nice house. We had two kitchens, two bathrooms, an attic. We always thought the attic was haunted. <laughs> we used to say it was haunted, but um, it was good. And so my mom, I guess the person, the landlord was selling a house or whatever. And at that time, I think my mom had signed up for a, a housing voucher. We didn't know what that was at the time, but she got us together and she was like, look, we have to move, the guy is selling his house, and we have to move to the projects in East Oakland. And my brothers and sisters, it's <laughs> like, East Oakland, but I was happy. I'm like, yeah, yeah, East Oakland. So um, we moved there, and um, at first it was a culture shock, but we, we were a product of our environment, environment I would say, because it was it was crazy. Like this was one of those known projects. Um, I don't know if you guys heard of the Ville um, uh, Felix Mitchell. Yeah. He was like the he was like um, Nino Brown, the New Jack City of that neighborhood, and he had it organized. He had everything. But by the time we got there, he had already went to jail. But it, it was crazy. Still, it was still off the hook. Um, his funeral. We went to his wake. Um, me and my mom went to his wake. Um, two guys, two mob guys came in. They looked at his body. Then they looked at each other, and they nodded at each other, and they went back out. I thought I was in a movie. <laughs> I said, ooh, they in a the mob. They in a the mob for real. Because <laughs> that's what they used to reference, uh, the village 69 mob. So I said, they are really in the mob. And so that went on. I saw so much stuff in the village, some bad, some good. Um, but it was like we were all a family. Like, we still get together and uh, have annual picnics. Matter of fact, that's tomorrow that I'm going to go to. And it's never been no drama. It's like a whole big family reunion. So, um, so at the time, I was working at Eastmont Mall. If you guys from Oakland, you know about Eastmont Mall. It was off the hook back in the day. Ooh. And I worked right where you could see everything. I worked in the cookie place right in the middle. I saw everything. If you're from Oakland, you remember Frank the Bank. Too Short used to come in there. Frank the Bank used to come in there with his holes. And it was just like, I was just like looking at a, a movie or something. I was like, oh, my God. So anyway, it was the, the security guards there. And um, one, a couple of them um, moonlighted because they were OPD. So I end up dating one of them. Um, I thought I was dating him, but I was young and dumb back then. I didn't know he was married. But anyway, um, he used to pick me up in the cop car, and I thought it was so cool, but found out that it wasn't cool because the village people, they was like, why is she getting, they asked one of my friends that already lived there, they say, why is she getting dropped off in a cop car like, we need to talk to her. She need, They said, Vito want to see you. You need to have a sit down with Vito. I'm like, is this really the mob or what? <laughs> and I was like, what do you want to talk to me about? Because I was so naive. I did not think, I wasn't thinking. I'm like, you in the village, but you getting dropped off in a cop car. They don't think you a snitch. And I look back at it. I'm like, so stupid. So, um, yeah, so he talked to me. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. No, I don't. I'm not snitching. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. And I wasn't because I was so naive. But I didn't know the cop was trying to use me to snitch. But it wasn't happening. I knew that much. But um, so I said, man, I gotta prove something to them. I don't want them to think that. So I end up selling drugs for a little bit. Even though I was working, I started selling drugs and. You know, it wasn't my cup of tea, but I did it. And then I end up 
doing drugs, um, mixing um, crack cocaine with weed. They call them Grimmies back then. So I started doing that. Yeah, <laughs> I graduated and started smoking a pipe. I'm like, wow. But by that time, I had um, I met my husband. I was wor- a dispatcher at a security company, and um, he walked in. And p- people say there ain't love at first sight. There is love at first sight because it happened with me and my husband. And I was so nervous. I had butterflies. I don't know why because I never had met this man before. But um, we end up. Uh, dating, and he was living with somebody, and you know that movie, um, Harlem Nights, when the guy told told his wife, I'm not never coming home no more. <laughs> well, that happened, well, that happened with me, well, him, he told her he wasn't coming back, so <laughs> there you go. And so, um, you know, it was good. We got married in seven months, and again, I still didn't know anything about red flags. I should have known something when we went to go elope, and the police stopped us. And I was like, well, we're going to get married. And he was like, okay, you guys can go. That was a sign, though, right there. So everything was fine and dandy. <clears throat> and then, like a couple of weeks after, he hit me, and I was like, Oh, my God. I I was, like, shocked at first, and then I came to my senses. I'm like, I'm out of here. And his cousins was visiting from Alabama, and at that time, my mom, she still lived in the village, and I had moved, followed him. I would have followed him to the moon if I needed to, but I followed him in Richmond, didn't know nothing about Richmond, but I tell you one thing, they are so country out there. (laughs) They like... (laughs) They was like, is that your car? I'm like, what do you mean, car? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, man. They so country out there. And um, so I ended up um living there, even though it was it was it was off the hook back then. Now it's it's much better. But um I stay I so I packed up my stuff and I left and went back to the village, you know, where my family was. And um even his cousin was encouraging, encouraging me, don't let him do that to you, that's my cousin, but no, that ain't cool. You don't hit women. I said, right, so they pumped me up, so I packed up my stuff, he had went somewhere, and I left. And he came back, he came back begging and pleading, and of course, I went back because I was still in love with him. So that went on for three years, we moved to San Francisco. Um, I didn't know anything about San Francisco, just Fisherman's Wharf. <laughs> That's a shame what is right over the bridge. And um, so when we was out there, he was showing me the ropes about San Francisco. Yeah, we can come out here, get a room. We can get on GA, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, GA, I'm going to get a job. Always worked. Always worked. But um, I said, okay. Um, So we walking down. I can't remember what street it was. And this guy was laying in the streets. And I was like, Michael, we have to call 911. He was like, what do you mean call 911? I said, his, something is wrong with him. Let's call 911 because I'm a, I'm, I'm a nurturer. And um, he was like, nine. He calls me nine, nine. You don't call 911. That's his house. He lives there. I'm like, what? It wasn't never like that in Oakland. Now it is. But it was so weird when I came out to Frisco. I said, the bus goes through the projects out here? <laughs> they don't do that in Oakland. So um, it was a lot. I said, they're smoking crack on the streets out here. I could never. So anyway, um, went through that, ended up getting a hotel, got housing, got, um, you know, got um, housing. And um, after we lived in a hotel for a while, they give you housing if you sign up for certain places out here. I mean, Frisco is so spoiled. They have so many resources that it's ridiculous. Nobody shouldn't be hungry out in San Francisco or shouldn't be unhoused. But, you know, I know it's certain situations that you do be unhoused. But um, I went through that for a while, and um, the last straw was he had, um, I forgot, oh, his friend lived with us. And um, for some reason, he thought I liked him or something. I'm like, no, I don't, come on now. Anyway, he hit me and gave me a black eye, and I never had a black eye, and I'm like, that's it. It's time for me to go. 
because I, I could tell you so many situations where like he was enraged, like you seasoned the food too much and um, threw a, a full jar of mayonnaise a jar at me. Um, he broke a broom on me. I'm surprised I didn't end up in the hospital or whatever. So I went through that and I'm like, I'm tired. I'm sick and tired of being tired. So, and we both was doing drugs. Don't get me wrong. I was involved in drugs, but I didn't fuck with nobody. I didn't bother nobody. And just for him to just like, just straight beat me up wasn't cool. So, and I still never told my family. So finally, I went back to my mother's name, and I said, I'm tired. And I told my brothers this time. Well, they went over, they, <clears throat> they went over there looking for him and um, knocked on the door. And I think he jumped out the window or whatever. But um, so, you know, I got myself together. Um, my best friend, um, she had a cousin that I always had a crush on, but um, never hooked up or nothing. And she was like... See, you need to talk to you need to talk to Bill. I'm like, I really don't want to talk to nobody, but I met him, so we met for the first time, and um, I was like, and I gave her the thumbs up because he gave me a hug, and I was doing this. I gave her the thumbs up. <laughs> she was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at that time, I couldn't really trust nobody. I'm like, am I gonna have to run in this relationship? He treated me so good, treated me like a queen, and I was not used to that. I mean, he gave me surprises. He just did everything, and I was like, wow, it really, it, it, it really is good guys out here. And um, so, um, but I sabotaged it because I didn't think it was, I thought it was too good to be true, end up doing drugs again and just sabotaging the whole relationship. And me and his cousin used to get high. I'm going to tell you this one story. She had hit a lick for 1500 and she said, we should, um, I'm going to get a room at the embassy. I think that's up here on Larkin or whatever. I'm going to get a room at the, the uh, embassy. We had crack for days. <laughs> and then somehow she, she scared of her cousin. So somehow he found the code. He called her and said, I'm going to tell your dad. I'm blah, blah, blah. And she feels, she got such a conscience. She feels so guilty. She's like, I'm leaving. I'm going home. He said he's going to tell my dad, blah, blah. I'm like, well, bye, girl. I'll see you. <laughs> I'll see you later. I was there getting high by myself. And then somebody knocked on the door. And it was, I saw that silver badge. And I'm like, I had crack all on the bed. I'm like, oh, my God. So I opened it. I'm like, can I help you? He's like, yeah, uh, you're my, he was my fiancé at the time. He said, you haven't been home, like, in three days. And I'm like, um, you know, I played it off. I'm like, yeah, because we were fighting. So I just got a room. And I said, they bet not come in here. They bet not step one foot in this room. <laughs> they didn't come in. And then I cussed him out. Why do you snitch on me? You know what I was doing. He knew what I was doing. But, you know, that's just, that was his concern. And I didn't, you know, I, I didn't care at the time. And it wasn't that I was with guys. Because I didn't used to like to get high with guys. You know, it was either his cousin or me by myself. So, um you know, he, he was concerned, and he was worried about me, and, um, you know, of course I went off on him, because don't be sending the police up to the hotel. You know I was getting high. Shit, fucking up my eye. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway um, so that went on for a while, and I end up, um, or let me back up, because this, it all stems from um, my childhood when I was 14. Back then, they used to give... Um, House parties, you know, um, you know, we come from, we really was born in the twumps um, in the 20s. And it used to be this guy named Joe Roche. He used to give house parties every weekend. And they used to be so fun, so nice, no drama or nothing. And so one day, like I said, you know, Oakland was safe back then. One day I was coming home from the party and I felt somebody like, like kind of following me and so I started speeding up and he um he followed me and he put a knife on me and told me if you scream I'll kill you and I was so pissed off because I was so pissed off be now that I look back at it because I was right in front of my house but I was so scared I was 14 of course I'm not gonna scream and he took me around the corner and he sexually assaulted me 
And I was in shock for a while. I didn't. I came home. I didn't tell my mother. I got in the bathtub. I didn't tell anybody till about 15 years later. I finally told my sister, and she was like, "Oh my God, why didn't tell nobody?" I'm like, every time I think about that, it pisses me off. But um, so that happened, and that was one of the reasons why I start. Uh, ref- um, getting high, you know, I just wanted to escape, escape the pain, getting high because I was getting hit. So that was the only thing that made me feel better. Um, Finally, I said, you know what, I can't keep doing this. I need to see a therapist. Um, You know, because in in the African American family, um, that was like taboo, like, what, you're not crazy, you better drink some ginger ale or go to bed or something. (laughs) Or, you know, they didn't really believe in going to see a therapist. And it's so ironic now that I'm I'm on my way to being a therapist. But um, so, you know, I said, you know, I'll do it. So it was this place called Clinic Without Walls. And I was still getting high a little bit, but I was, you know, trying to use harm reduction on myself. You know, I went from every day to like a couple of days a week. And soon as I come, soon as I come in, because the the uh, the place was on in the Valencia Gardens, and um, that's where my <laughs> drug dealer used to be. And I seen him coming out the building, and I was like, "Hey, can you?" <laughs> so I say, "I'll do this after the," because I know I'm gonna need it after the uh, therapy session. And um, you know, of course, I boohooed, and she was like oh my God, you've been through so much. And I was like, yeah, I have. And for some reason I pulled out my phone, but um, so when I left, finally left, I didn't see my my rock I had. I was like, oh my God, I must have fell in her office. <laughs> so I went back, I said, did you see a piece of candy on the floor? <laughs> she was like, no, no, I didn't see any candy. But later on found out that she threw it away. She thought it was candy and she threw it away. I'm like, damn. And I was like, fuck. And um, you know, I really wanted some after that session, but you know, that's how life goes. And say, I, I said, I need to get myself together. Oh, also, I haven't been to the pen like these guys. I, can, I, can't, I can't imagine, but I have been to jail. I've been to Santa Rita. They call that the baby pen, and it's terrible. It is terrible. Oh, my God. So I felt like I was in the pen. So I did nine months, um, and that was because I used to uh, pass fictitious checks and then I'm like, God, I'm always in a bank. You know, it was it was working for me. You know, I um, it was working for me for a minute because uh, even though I had a job, I was still being greedy. Like it's an adrenaline rush. Like when you come out the bank with money in your hand. So I did that for a while, and I'm like, Hmm, I'm always in the bank. Why don't I rob it? <laughs> so. <laughs> So, um, well, there was this guy, I had a little encouragement. It was this guy, well, I encouraged him, actually. He did, he did a lot of time. He had just got out the feds, and um, I was asking him, so is it that easy to rob a bank? What do you have to do? What do you have to do? I think that's so cool. I want to rob a bank. So I just kept being on him and on him and on him, and finally, I guess he said, okay, let's do it. So um, we did it. Even though I, I was in a in a crack coma, the, 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 I woke up. He said, okay, we here. I went in there with a note, and, um, you know, I said, you know, give me the money or, you know, I'll kill you or something, even though I was bluffing. I didn't have a gun or anything. And he looked at me like, are you serious? <laughs> it's like, you don't look like no bank robber. And I was trying to have a poker face. He said, I said, listen, go get the money. <laughs> Man, he went to the back. I was being greedy. I stayed there, and finally, I I got it. I'm like, oh, they called the police. The police, I hear the sirens, blah, 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 all that. I walked right past them, and um, I guess they didn't think it was me, but I I had on some slip-ons, so I couldn't run. And they was like, there she is right there. And so they got me at the bank, uh, Bank of America by the lake on Harrison, Man, and um, but I will say, but 
the, the seven years is up, I think. But I will say, I did get away with one, Robin one. I think the seven year uh, thing is over. What do they call it? The statue, I think it's over. But this one. <laughs> But you this one, <laughs> this one, I did, I didn't get away. It was attempted robbery, and he was trying to get me to tell me who put it up to me, who put it, who put you up to this. I know you didn't do this by yourself. They were so nice to me. I mean, giving me food, bringing me food. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Nobody put me up to it. I wanted to rob the bank. <laughs> well, how did you get here? I say I caught the bus. And um, yeah. it was it was crazy. So was I, didn't, I didn't say anything. And so he was like, um, so they they's like, take her ass to jail <laughs> after they knew I wasn't giving up nothing. And so I did uh, nine months in Santa Rita. It was in the paper. And my brother was in Santa Rita on the other side, which is embarrassing. And he called my mother. He's like, Mama, do you know Nida? Nida's in the paper, in the newspaper. And she was like, Oh my God! And then I was—I felt so bad because my mother, you know, she was in the church and all that, and all her church people was gonna find out, and it was just biggest day in the newspaper. And I was like, Oh my God, that's so embarrassing. And so, um, I did the nine months, and of course, I had a moment of clarity when I got out. I said, um. I'm I'm never coming back here. I'm never going to say, you know, never say never. But um, that was in 2008, and I haven't been back in trouble ever since. Yeah, I still was doing, still getting money. I still was getting money. Um, I tell you, I always had a job. So I ended up working at the parole office, and um, which was cool. I loved it. Um, it was this program called Basin Bay Area Service Network. And, um, you know, we used to do the packed meetings and um, do all that. And um, that job was so cool because I felt so protected. And um, But I still was being greedy. So I did one while I was on my lunchtime. And the guys, the parole officer, and there was some police in there. They was like, hey, Nina, come in here. We giving a... <laughs> Surprise party, one of the guys are leaving. I was so nervous. I was sweating like bullets, so scared because I had just went in the bank. I was like, oh, my God, I can't keep living like this. <laughs> I cannot keep living like this. So, um, you know, I end up uh, getting a, 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 a job that I like uh, working um, in a community, uh, working with the homeless and the mental health. It was, I loved it. I loved it. I'm still there, actually. Um, well, not that one, but um, I was working as a receptionist, and the guy, um, the, one of the ladies, like, Nina, you know, you would be really good um, working with the mental health people. I say, I don't have no experience. I never worked with mental health people. They was like, yeah, but your attitude, you know, you could try out for it. So I, um, Conard House, I applied for Conard House. And I end up getting a job. They said I aced the interview. People always say interviews make you nervous. Not me. I guess I look at it. This is how I think. I look at it, look at it as a movie audition. So I think <laughs> I'm for a movie because <laughs> I always wanted to be an actress. So that's how I look at it. So I don't get nervous. So I aced that and I started, uh, you know, working in the mental health field. And um, I loved it. And I was so compassionate. But... You know, a lot of the clients, like, died on me. Like, one of the uh, guys, that's why it started getting to me. That was the part I didn't like, you know, the clients dying when you work with them so closely and then they die on you. You know, one of the guys, um, one of the police called me at her corner, coroner's office, called me and said, um, are you Nina Clark? I'm like, yeah. And they was like, um, we, Famous had, uh, it was this guy named Famous. He was so sweet. And he he had uh, my card in his pocket. He said he had your uh, card in his pocket, and I'm tell you he's deceased. We need you to come identify the body. I'm like, what? He don't have any family or anything. So I went down there, you know, and told him that it was him. And then it just started happening back to back, and it was just a lot. It was it was a lot, and it just got to me. And um, like this one guy, I uh, advocated for him to get uh, 
the landlord had, was slumlord, had turned off his water, and this was in a hotel. I'm like, why would you turn off his water and he's paid his rent? What, what are you doing? Why are you turning off his water? So I made him turn it. Well, I asked him. I didn't make him. I told him to turn it back on, you know, or he, he wasn't going to get any more rent. And so we were closed, but the guy, Brian Blaney, I'll never forget it because he had swastikas all on his arm and, you know, everywhere. But he changed his life, and he was not like that anymore. So I worked with him. He was so cool. And... um he was like, hey, Nina, they turned my water back on. They turned my water back on. I'm like, cool, Brian, yay. I told you I could do it. And, you know, the same day he get hit by a diesel truck, that just took me out. Like, it was just like back to back. And then this one a guy was going around, I don't know if you guys remember, he was um, slashing people's throats. And he slashed one of my clients' throat. They called him the vampire or something. Anyway, it was crazy. I'm like, I can't. It's, it's just too much. It's just too much. But I, I still stuck with it. And I stayed in that field. And now I am working for Felton Institute. Um, you know, I haven't went in any more banks. <laughs> I've been working for them. This is my ninth year. I think I want to retire. I'm just tired. I've been working since I was 14. Um, I think I want to retire on my 10th year, but of course we know Social Security doesn't give you enough money to retire, so you still have to work. But um, I'm, I've been dreaming about it. I'm like, I just want to be home. So um, yeah, so I, um, I've i been with them and they um, said, hey, Nina, you want to go to school? Um, you know, they have this cohort going on, this drug and alcohol cohort going on. Uh, you know, you can apply, you know, we'll pay for it. And I was thinking, I said, yeah, I do it. I was going more towards the, the healthcare worker uh, class, but I did that class, and I'm glad I did it. I'm like, shit, I did drugs. I might as well study them. <laughs> so, so I graduated in 2020. I was so proud of myself. Um, during that time, at that time, um, my mom passed away, and I didn't think I can finish the class, but um, I ended up finishing it. I guess she gave me. She gave me motivation. She gave me motivation, and um, I'm glad I did it, but I still have to take the state test. And when I take the state test, I'm going to go back to school for a year, and then I'm going to transfer to state because <clears throat> I want to be a therapist. <laughs> yeah, I thank, you, I thank you guys for listening. I just want to say I know about all the red flags now, and so if this touched anybody... You know, if it touched a woman, you know, watch out for the red flags. You know, they're there. You just got to look out for them and just just leave. Don't stay in a relationship. Leave when the first thing happens. Just leave. You know, I know that now. Then I didn't. But somebody touched me. If somebody hit me today, I might be going back to jail. All right. Thanks, Nina. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Nina, I want to say thank you uh, for, for sharing your personal story, and, uh, and hopefully it does impact somebody uh, regarding uh, domestic violence. Uh, but I want to, like, uh, gear this back towards, like, uh, uh, returning citizens, right? And um, so when you have somebody that's uh, been stigmatized by the, you know, uh, it's almost like a scarlet letter in a sense, um, you have uh, domestic violence, uh, victim who is embarrassed to speak about what they've gone through. Uh, that person uh, doesn't know how to, to reach out and talk to a support system or uh, is unaware of a, a support system that's there for them. Um, that too is very similar to what a person who has been incarcerated may uh, experience. Um, it's almost as though you're wearing a scarlet letter in a sense um, for me, for many years, I didn't want anyone to know that I had been incarcerated. Did not want anyone to know. Much like a domestic violence individual, right? Right. So, for me, you know, it was embarrassing. And it was like, how am I going to own this? How am I going to be able to be okay with having, number one, committed a crime and, and harmed innocent people? And two, to be able to walk amongst the community and 
meet new people and tell them who I am, really who I am. Because like I said, for many years, I was embarrassed. I was shamed. I didn't know how to express that. I didn't know how to translate from like, no, but really I am changed. Really, I did that, yes, but really that's not who I am. So I understand that part of it. I understand that part of it. It's, and, 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 you know, I think that what we have here uh, amongst uh, the folks at RCA is that we are able to be able to translate what it was having been incarcerated and who we have become today. The past is the past, and we live for today. Nothing about us without us, right? right? Reclaiming our lives, reclaiming our stories. That's what we're doing, reclaiming our lives, reclaiming our stories. So I am no longer embarrassed by who I was. I am proud of who I am today. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, another summit that we're, we're, we're partaking in. This is summit number nine for returning citizens. Uh, this is uh, resilience for a purpose. Um, we are talking about what it is to be resilient and our purpose moving forward. All right. Okay. So next, uh, next up, we have uh, Ramon Day. Ramon Day is a, a friend of mine. Uh, Ramon is, um, Ramon has been married for 20 years. He has two children and one grandchild. And as a seasoned professional in the medical industry, he has a career spanning decades and his professional, professionalism cannot be denied. Ramon also serves as a project director for RCA. Rain or shine, you can always count on him to show up with a smile a willingness to lend a helping hand. Whether it's organizing events, assisting with fundraisers, or simply offering a supportive presence, Ramon is the dependable pillar we can always rely on. His commitment to making a positive impact in the community makes him an invaluable asset and a true inspiration to us all. And Ramon, I have to tell you, when you hosted the, the series, <laughs> you did a hell of a job, buddy, because uh, cause this is some big foot, <laughs> uh, big, big shoes to step into. Thank you, bro. All Thank right. You. <clears throat> Can I say um, one thing before you get started? Please. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, Ramon is the reason I am a part of RCA. It's like uh, we was, you know, you see people in the streets and you, um, you respect them for us, basically, being criminals at that time, the best of the criminals you could be. And it's like now we live in our lives and we are finding out the individuals that we did respect in the game that they are real people and they really handling their business out here and they can be an example. So when I saw him on the thing, I was like, oh yeah, I know him. It's got to be something going on over there. It wasn't nothing slick. It was like I know him as a person as far as on it. It's got to be something real to it. And that's what got me to RCA. When I saw him, I'm like, there's something going on over there. You know what I mean? And this is what allows us to be able to say, you never know who's watching, who you're going to be able to affect. And it's now, um, I found my purpose because of this man right here. And I appreciate it. And Ramon, do what you do. First and foremost, let me say uh, those were some incredible intros. I want to appreciate y'all to the fullest for that. I feel like Superman right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that being said, um, I am Ramon Day. I'm a returning citizen. Um, somebody had to bring that to my attention. And the reason being is because, like, when we saying resilience and purpose, I just been resilient without even knowing I was resilient. And I say that because um, ain't finna be no stereotyping. Ain't finna be no labeling. Ain't finna be no telling me that 
this is what I am and this is what I'm supposed to get. Because I'm different. I want more. And I'm, not, I'm just not going to be satisfied with what you're offering. So what happens is, and the reason I say that like that is because Going back to what Brian said, okay, first, uh, we shameful, you know, because we're an ex-felon, an ex-con, things of that nature. And I, I don't really think that those labels should define a person, like who you are, because when you go by that label, you totally being misrepresented. That, that, that don't define me. Um, the definition of Ramon is great father. That's my cousin right there, great cousin. That's my nephew right there. Um, and things of that nature. Um, I've always been a person that always want to see another person grow. I always engage some people some game because the game I give you don't take nothing away from me. It don't take nothing off my plate. So, um, Anyway, because I'll be going all over the place when I get to Ram, so y'all y'all just kind of like bear with me. So I, I wrote down um, I wrote down the definition. Wait, somewhere. Anyway, I wrote down the I wrote down a definition to uh, purpose, and purpose is abiding intention to achieve a long-term goal that's both personal and meaningful and makes a positive mark on the world. Um, that's me. Um, I want to be impactful. I, I want to be a, a person that people can come to and I won't lie to you. I'll tell you the truth, even if it hurts your feelings, but it's the truth because the truth don't change. You ain't never got to remember that when somebody come up and ask you again, when you tell them the truth, that's what you get. So, so what happens is with the stereotype and all that and, and me becoming a returning citizen, and again, I got to give, uh, I got to give Slick credit for that because he the one reminded me. Cause like I say, I just was so far away from it. So I, I, I've, I've been to prison um, three times. Um, each time new commitment because I had a better plan than the last one. So I was able to stay out just a little bit longer. But the thing about me going to prison and, 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 and why it's so bitter for me is because people was telling. Like the police didn't even get a chance to be good police <laughs> because somebody else was policing, you know? And <clears throat> you kinda, you, like, like I say, um, I'm a good spirited person, person with good heart. Um, ain't nobody I turn down in time of need. Like, I give you some help. And so I always was struggling with, why would they tell on me? Yeah, they should have told on him. Or you should have just turned yourself in, you know? But why you tell on me? And so I've always had an issue with that. But the other thing is, <clears throat> so when you, when you get arrested and you're going through all these motions, and a whole lot of self-doubt creep in, regardless of all the confidence you had up until the time you got caught, right? It's a lot of self-doubt. And so what happens is now you gotta you gotta get into this to this whole different lifestyle and no juvenile hall, no getting in trouble as a child because I was scared of my mama. Like when she said, nah, and you gonna get and I believe that, so I waited till I got grown to really start screwing up and finding out about the judicial system and going to court. And it's a life I wish I would have never found out about. I just say that. And so, you know, um, I go, I go to jail, uh, and I said this before, and just the whole encounter from having to sit in a room with an individual and shit next to him. And you know, that that shit ain't cool. But you couldn't tell, or it was almost, I was almost given the impression that I liked it because I kept slipping back into the same shit, <laughs> you know? And so, <clears throat> the, 
the last time that I went, which was on this 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 case that I had, it was a federal case. Um, again, the dude came talking about how he need help, blah blah. That's not even important, but it hurt because you know because be, because of the resilience and having a purpose, I was able to come home and get my shit back together again. So I was a sterile processor. Um, I got stripped of sterile processing. And the things that happen is when you when you got certain um job titles or or um what's the word occupations, mm -hmm. um, they not felon friendly. You know, um a felon to strip you of your livelihood. Right. And for me, I just that was unacceptable. It was just unacceptable. Like you're not finna take what I've been striving for my whole life and tell me that I can't do it no more because, okay, well, we're supposed to get away with one bad decision, but I had three. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was still work in progress, right? <laughs> but we gonna get it right, though. <laughs> and so it hurt because <clears throat> I got everything together. Uh, me and my wife had another son. Um, you know, when you had that first child, it's like practice. Mm -hmm. No, it is because you, you don't know because parenting don't come with a handbook. You get what I'm saying? So on the first one, you kind of like, you know, that's a freestyle. <laughs> but when the second one come, you kind of got your parenting thing together because, you know, you don't want to do this one, what you did with that one. And, and then we're a little bit more grounded. So um, not that the first child wasn't amazing, but the second was just amazing. And, and then, like, we got our stuff together. We buying a house. Um, I'm moving away from all the stuff that's, that's not cool. Um, to be honest, when I, when I caught this last case, I wasn't even slinging no more. Um, it was just somebody coming up to me with a bullshit thing saying that they needed some help. Can I do this just to get him out of trouble and put me in trouble. And so, you know, um, during my incarceration period, right, um, my son got sick. He ended up having a um, benign brain tumor in the back and on his mom's side. They kind of got a family history of that. And so what happens with me is uh, my counselor calls me into his office. And, you know, anytime they call you, shit, that can't be good. I'm trying to figure out what the fuck I did because I don't really do nothing but just work out and go to school. I was going to college the whole time I was um, locked up. And um, tell you that I need, you know, he tell me I got to call home. And I ain't really one for calling home. Like, time for me is something that you just got to do by yourself. Like, even though you have support and people are helping you, like, I didn't like calling home. Because if I call home and then I get news like that, ain't shit I could do. So it just make my time harder. It just make me stress more. Because I'm used to being that pillar in my family of helping who needs some help. So if I can't get to him, I mean, it, it just made the time harder. And so I did a lot of crying, man, and, and, and a lot of soul searching. And, and I said, you know, I can't never do this again. I can't never put my family in this type of situation. I can't put myself in this type of situation. And so, like I say, I'm, I'm hopping around and stuff. And so eventually, like, um, when I do get back to the turf and I'm telling everybody, yeah, I'm done, I'm done, nobody believes me because I've been saying that shit before. <laughs> <laughs> so ain't nobody buying what I'm selling, right? <laughs> so. I got to pull forth some action, right, and let them see that I really meant it. And so the other, the other, you know, the, the flip side and, and, and it's uh, having resilience where the purpose is. So I, I, I'm a trained professional, but now I got to go down to damn labor ready and get a job mm. because they the only one accepting felons. And you know what come with that labor ready work, yeah. BS. <laughs> and um, you know, it's uh, it's building character because you know, I, I, I'm a very likable person, and I'm thinking right. All I got to do is just 
slide back to my old job and they gonna let me in regardless of the rules. And it didn't work like that. So I had to do this labor ready stuff for about two years before I was actually able to get back in to my trained profession. And um, it definitely made me appreciate it a whole lot more. Um, when you when you coming home, man, and you gotta you gotta talk to the parole officer. You gotta get your family back right. You know, it's it's hella obstacles that people take for granted. That if if you if you're not a strong minded individual, yeah, you might get another chance at another bid. I stay strong on this one and. What they be saying, down 10 toes, I was down 12, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so here I am, and sometimes you got to, you know, uh, do circumstances become motivational? Do that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. Your circumstances motivating you to, you know, bring out the best in you are not even really the best, some damn discipline. Right. Because that's what happens when we doing what we do. We, we get the lack of discipline. And uh, man, I'm so disciplined now, y'all wouldn't believe, like, I eat vegetables and everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, you know, so like, the trauma and the stuff that you see in prison like, I don't care what nobody say, that got to be the closest thing to hell. Um, the way you treat it, you get, you get treated less than a human being. It's hurtful. Um, it's definitely uh, not a morale booster when you're incarcerated, <laughs> right? You got to dig deep in your soul and come out with everything you got just to get through it. Um, It's, it's uh for me being back on this side means everything. Um, man, y'all have no idea um, what you go through in that place, and I don't really want to brag on it. I just want to brag on being uh, being determined to get my life back, you know, because that's what happens, man. You know, you get in them situation and you, you don't even realize that your life is being taken away from you. And due to, to, to family and a great support system, I was able to overcome a lot of things because a lot of people who get out when they're incarcerated, sometimes they ain't even got a home to go to. Ain't no car, you know, um, situation dire. You looking for a halfway house to stay with somebody and things like that. And I didn't have those, I didn't have those situations, thank God. Um, always been a planner though, like, I don't, I don't try to live for the day. I try to live for three months down the line. Mm -hmm. You know, um, always have been like that. Oh, all that to my mom. My mom was a, a real uh, guiding factor in my life. Um, gave me hella responsibility at a young age. Had me going to the store paying bills when I was like seven with her check. And, and, and the bills rolled out. So I got good with budgeting money at a young age. But not only that, I got, I, I, I was, she handed me responsibility. So I knew like when it was my turn, I knew, don't go get the Nikes before you pay the light bill. <laughs> you know, you gotta have your priorities forced, and that's what moms did for me. But um, you know, returning citizens, man, has been a blessing because this is why it's been a blessing because trauma don't have no face. You know. Like, right now, I am happy, but I wasn't for a while. 
due to trauma. And you never know, like, it, it change, it change the trajectory when you, like, now when I see certain people, or you might see one of these homeless people walking down the street and they blowing spit bubbles and you over there saying, oh, damn, they crazy. But they might not be crazy. It might have something to do with like how Nana shared her assault. Some people never recover from that. Some people are never the same, no matter what kind of help they get, what, what kind of counseling. And so you always got to put stuff like that in consideration. I'm, I'm just glad that I've been a very strong-minded person. Um, I'm glad that I got people that believe in me. Um, and I'm also glad to be a person that people kind of, um, like Marcus said, look up to. Because I, I, I ain't know he look up to me. I'm looking up to him, you know? So, so that's a blessing. Um, When when we get the when we get the the stereotype about ex felon and all that, I just want to be a dad. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good friend. You know, them 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 are the uh, definitions of me. Not not the ex felon and not all that. Um, I never liked that. I never like at. At a certain point, you're supposed to be wearing like, "Oh, I've been to the pen, like it's a badge of honor." Man, fuck that. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I never. It was never a badge of honor for me. It was a badge of embarrassment, just like Brian said. Like, and the fact that I was able to get back on my feet and do things the way I left it is a blessing. And everybody got to have fight in them. To get where they going, you can't, you can't sidestep, you can't take shortcuts, and the other thing is what 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 Marcus said. So so me and my cousin, we was crimeys, right? And he just got one little thing that happened to him, and he was done. He was done. Nah, not me. I needed some extras. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I needed some extras. So I'm gonna give it one more go. And the reason I'm saying that is because, like Marcus said, so my cousin quit when he was supposed to. House, house paid for, cars paid for, uh, about to retire in two years. Now I'm still working on my retirement. I'm still trying to pay for my house, all because of bad decisions. So at the end of the day, the trade, that shit didn't equal out. <laughs> and so I've always been very honest with people who ask me about stuff like that. And I tell them the truth to try to detour them. Like, I, I'm not highlighting being incarcerated. That shit's just very uncool. Um, what my time like, Brian? Couple minutes. All right. So, so let me just tell you like one thing that happened one time when I was in jail and we was in dorm living. And, you know, I was dead asleep. And the next thing you know, I heard somebody, oh! and turn over, and the dude getting the dog shit beat out of him. Scared to death. I'm not finna sit here and be like, oh, I was a big badass, and I was finna jump over there and get me a, a lick in too. I ain't want no parts of that shit. That's when I knew it was the last time. That's all I got for y'all. Man, um, so that's a, that's a powerful testimony, Ramon, and I got to tell you, like, for those of us who have been incarcerated, uh, 
family members who have been there to support those who have been incarcerated, um, friends of persons who have been incarcerated. Uh, this, this is a, a real testament to what an individual who has been incarcerated goes through. Uh, I'd, I'd like to share a, a moment about um, a few things that uh, touched me. And Ramon uh, talked about getting a, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a call or a ducket to go visit your, <laughs> to go visit your counselor. Yeah. And I can remember that I was in Susanville, and I had only been in, incarcerated at that time for two years. And I get a call to the lieutenant's office in, in the night, which is abnormal. Can't be good. <laughs> abnormal. And the lieutenant tells me, your brother's in the hospital. OK. What's wrong? His lung has collapsed. And they're testing him for cancer. Don't know how long I'm going to be in prison. All I know is that I can't be there for him. I cannot be there for him. And so when you're alone, you're all alone. You're all alone. There yeah. is no one there that has your best interest like you have your best interest or your family has your best interest. And so phone calls were not easy to come by and visits really weren't easy to come by because I was in Northern California at the very tip by Reno. <clears throat> so I can understand and I empathize for that period of time. And I know that that was a, a tremendous struggle, a tremendous struggle because of the uncertainties and the helplessness of not being able to be there and, and give, that, part, give that comfort. Also, I wanted to, to touch upon uh, what, what Marcus had said earlier. And, you know, one of the things that, that we've transitioned into our, our lives today is now being dependable and selfless. Whereas sure. before, we were selfish. We didn't consider the other people's lives that we were impacting. We didn't consider the people that we victimized. We didn't consider our families. We only thought about self and what I looked like or how I was going to get that. And, and I got to tell you, it, it, didn't, it didn't pay dividends for me. <laughs> it didn't pay dividends for me. It definitely didn't. You know? And, you know, when we see people that are on the street here in San Francisco or elsewhere, Oakland, or wherever that, might, that person might be that's homeless, suffering, mental illness, whatever that case might be, I say to myself, there by the grace of God goes I. Right. There by the grace of God goes I. Because I know that through struggle... You know, I was fortunate enough to have that fortitude, that mental capability to, to be resilient. I was resilient. I'm a survivor. And a lot of people aren't strong. And they need help. And so we, as an organization, provide that help to those who are unable to help themselves at times. Or we have outreach programs that we are able to, to direct these people to so that, that they can receive that help that they need. So... I want to say that I am grateful for this organization because this organization has changed my life. It has empowered me to take back my life, to reclaim my life and reclaim my story. And with that, um, if there's anything else. Yeah. Go ahead, Mo. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I forgot that I really, I really want to speak on when we're talking about this, because all the time we're telling stories about us, right? And we saying what we went through and how we went through it. And we can't never um, take away what our spouses go through. You know, um, I really want to make that a vocal point. But once I got on and then, like, uh, I get kind of nervous, and too. And that's why I'm so glad that they got me up here speaking so I can get better at it. 
but I really want to put emphasis on like what you do to your significant other and like how your absence affects your children, how your absence affects the people, the loved ones around you that 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 you help constantly, like all the time. Cause like I say, I'm 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 very family oriented. And you don't know the impact that you have when you leave until they tell you, you look in their face and you, you look in their eyes and you can see that sadness. You can see that the impact that, that certain people have with their family, like it's not to be taken for granted because family everything to me, I, I'll be totally honest. And so while I'm around here boo-hooing about a package or boo-hooing about the dude that told on me, <laughs> when I should be worried about, well, well how you feeling? How the kids? How does this impact them? You know, how they feeling being without a dad? Because, like, my son, the one that passed away, um, really close. That's why I say, like, and, and it's, not, it's not to throw no shade at my other son, right, because he a junior, but it's just like you got more into your parenting um, as you get older, as you mature, as you become an adult and be responsible, okay? <laughs> These are the things that happen. And so um, the impact that you have on your family, you we don't even really get the idea. Because the other thing is this. We all trying to hide the hurt. You know, nobody wants to just give up the hurt. Like, because it, it's still a certain part of us that, you know, I walk with your chest out. You know what I'm saying? Say it loud. Say it proud. Like, I ain't gonna be telling nobody. Oh, I'm hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Walking around the line, telling me you're hurt. Nah, you, you gonna go over there in that thing, and you gonna handle that by yourself. Right. Many, many, <clears throat> many sleepless, crying nights on a bunk bed, wanting to be with my family, and then knowing that my family wants to be with me, and so I don't never want to um, downplay. Uh, family members in this as well, because sometimes they ain't got that spoken voice. Right. We always speaking about what we didn't get and what we didn't have and why you didn't come see me this particular time. Yeah. Like you ain't had no business to take care, like you weren't trying to go get that money for that PG&E and keep that phone on so I can call you. That part. So yeah, I just, I, I forgot that, and that was the main part, like, because I, I, I was writing so many notes down last night, like, I got to give them something powerful. <laughs> like, I got I got to make sure they feel it. And then I, I, I kind of got to mix my words up and stuff, but as I continue to go on, I'll get better and better. And like I said, I just want to make sure that that point was emphasized as well as, woe is me. So thank you guys for coming out. Thank you guys for listening to the stories. We really appreciate it. I'm a, I want to piggyback off of the same thing. Um, resilience for, and purpose for me was my wife and my children, and me recognizing the pain and the hurt that I inflicted on them. Yeah. So changes, it took place. And then I allowed myself to make these choices because they're the right ones to make. You know, that was the, 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 the starting point was me trying to make sure I don't see them tears and I look at my wife's face and understand me about these stories I got to tell and I'm not showing her how to do it. So once I got to that point, then it was more me working on myself and saying this is the right thing to do. And this is where I'm at today. And like I get phone calls from, you know, we still got folks that call that's in the box and they worried about, oh, they should be doing that out there. They should be doing out that, do this, doing this out there. One of my cousins got out and I, and I told him, I said, check this out, man. You can't be in there telling nobody out here what to do. You need to be here in order for you to make the change. So you can keep all that to yourself because it don't make no sense to me. And now he's been free for about six years. And he like, cuz, I remember when you told me that. Yeah, you can't make no change if you ain't here to make the change yourself. You know what I mean? And like the brother Moan, I know his, it was killing him to be in jail. You know what I mean? It was killing me also. But... Moan really, he been that responsible person for, since I knew him. You know what I mean? He been that dude. And I just was now learning what responsibility is in my 50s. You know? I know what it looked like. 
I've seen it the whole, my whole life, grandparents, moms, and all the Western there. But I did travel a different road that he did. I stayed in juvenile hall. As soon as they opened it up, I was knocking on the door, let me in there. You know what I mean? Let me in there. Every, every week, hey, man. You know what I mean? I'm in there. You know, but my mom, she said, boy, you go to prison, you on your own. For sure, I did 20 years. My mama didn't send a package, not a phone call, not a letter. And I wasn't even mad. She still on business. So that told me I can do the right thing. Before she passed, we were just like this. I had, she said, anybody got something to say to me before I'm gone? Speak your piece. That's, that was my mama. You know what I mean? And I ain't had nothing to say. You know, she just giving orders on her way out the door. Yeah, take care of your brother. Do this and do that. You know what I mean? But I'm like, I am that pillar of my family. I've always been that dude, even though I wasn't there. You know what I mean? But I'm here now. You know what I mean? And I'm uh, being able to show them exactly how it's supposed to get done. Yeah, we waver. We all waver. Life makes you waver. You know what I mean? But stay in that line. It's, it's a little box right there. Just stay in that box. You're going to be fine. You know what I mean? And just keep going straight ahead. But our families give us purpose, and it gives us reason to show up when the AT is down. You know, because we, we the last, we finna be the last generation. You know what I mean? The aunties and all that, they, they finna be gone and it's gonna be us. We on the second half of our life. You know what I mean? So it's like, okay, I wanna give all the kids and all my, my cousins them all the tools they need to be successful and this is what my purpose is. Then I'm like, okay, I'm trying to give it to the world so therefore they don't have to deal with the stuff that I know you're not built for. It's gonna be like, oh man, yeah, I've been to the pen. Hey right, man, you, you got caught, that's all that means. <laughs> You got caught, and you out here like, yeah, we want to get away, but you, it's a badge of honor. And when you continue to be around people that think like that, then you know you're in, in the circle of no growth. No growth. So it's like, this is why we can all sit and be like, man, that was some question that we just went through. You know what I mean? That wasn't cool. How much, bro, how much you did? 24? Ooh, that's, that's a long time for somebody to tell me what the hell to do. You know what I mean? It's these, we think different now. Not that you did it. A lot of people just doing it, just a shell in there. Sitting there for 30 years. It wasn't like he had, what was he doing? He was just in a box for 30 years. Not trying to go fucking crazy. Now, you, you gonna be different when you walk about that box. You can guarantee you that. If you stay in there six months, six days, 60 years, you gonna be different. And this is when you need to have these conversations with people that have been down that road. And that's what we're here for, you know what I mean? But I want to say that I appreciate my wife, my sister, and my daddy. My daddy would never give me nothing until I got in trouble. And he was there. We good now, though. I, I just want to say one more thing, too. Like, when, you, when, when they talk about all this time that people did, right, he, 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 got, a, he got a dime. And what you do, bro? Almost 18. See, so, so that's two decades, right? And then I got a decade because they took me out my 30s. Like, I didn't see, I only seen, like, the last tail end of my 30s. But, like, with the progress you make right now for yourself, with the progress you made for, for yourself right now, and with the progress I made for myself, just imagine those years that was taken and if we would have stayed there, what we would have. Just think about where we would be. You know what I'm saying? Because always business orientated, always taking care of what I'm supposed to. So instead of two houses, it could have been three, or it could have been some, some, some apartment buildings. Uh, I could be chief of staff of uh, sterile processing right now instead of lead tech. You know what I mean? So it, 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 it definitely stunts your growth, and it's a lot of wasted time. So I, I, that's why, I like, kids around me and, and, and kids that I've known, and even kids that, that – when when we was the shit, um, come in and hey hey man I want to be a man if you don't take your ass to school, right. well I want to be nah you don't want to be like me because you gonna fuck your life up. So don't want to be like me and and I always been told kids this and and I didn't have someone come up to me man I'm so glad you told me that OG, and then it'd be hard for me to get with the OG because I still be thinking I'm young and shit. So when they call me OG <laughs> I'd be like who are you talking to. <laughs> oh, gee, what? Yeah, shit, okay, all right. But, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's so many things that, that, that you go through in your mind after this. And then especially, like, even because we do Zooms every, every Sunday. Even after you get off the, uh, the Zoom, 
you replaying the Zoom, and then you you still replaying some other things that, that took place in your life that if we just would have had a little bit more, you know, guidance and stuff, and, and, and then like even like, like my mom was on my ass, but sometimes you need a dad too, because like my kids, the one thing I could say, no trouble. No trouble, and I was telling them early, like even when I went to jail, when they were, what happened? I told the truth. I didn't lie to him. Ain't no, oh, daddy out of state and he over here working on his job. No, daddy went to jail because daddy was fucking up. And I'm telling you the truth so your ass don't. Hey, you know what's so funny? My uncle, um, he works for the government. <clears throat> All my cousins, they out in um, Maryland. And I was like, man, where's cousin Marcus? My uncle, oh, he's, he's, uh, he out of state going to work. He been going for 10 years, what you mean? Yeah. Like, what kind of work. job is that, huh? Yeah, I, I had to tell my cousin when they grown, they like, man, my, my parents never told the truth of where you was at. I was in the penitentiary. Really? You know? Like, yeah, man. Maybe if you tell them, then they can have an understanding about what's going on. And like we say, we come from the era where so when the kids, are, you didn't just jump off the porch. If that's what you was going to do, you was going to do it. We wasn't incriminate. Come on, y'all. Come on. Let's go do this together. Like, no, nah, they out here committing crimes with nine and 10 people. 20, 30 people, so that's telling you they need, they crying out for some type of help. They want to follow something. We try to give them something and to follow to. they when they're doing this. Yeah, yeah. Why they you, committing it? You know, so it's like we know, we, we see the signs. We're the beginning of how certain these things t didn't happen. So we know exactly what we need to do. We just need to get in them rooms and be able to have this conversation with these kids. You know, it's like Ramon said, ain't none of my, I, I got two boys. Don't like them at all, but ain't none of them in jail. You know what I mean? They're good fathers with the kids and everything. And I got four girls, and they can have a conversation with their dad. And just being able to be able to have that conversation and be able to steer them which wherever they need to go, I gave them the information. My thing is that if I give you the information, you run with it or you don't. Ain't nothing else That's I can it. do. I, hey, if you, you don't give them the information, then, I, then you're a bad parent. If you don't give me the information, and this is what we try to do, we're just trying to give out the information so that for understand me, we can have some more successful people. And just like Ramon said, I'm sitting up in the box, two nephews murdered, 15 years old, and the rich, you know what I mean? Uh, my grandfather died. You don't, the reason why we don't ask, okay, how you doing at home? Because we can't do nothing about it. Now I'm finna go back to myself sick. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, man, what happened? Like, what? I watched on the news, I'm in the West name. Oh, 15 year old murder, whoop, whoop, whoop. What the? It's my nephew. My brother just died. That's how I ended up going to do the 10 years. And now his son then got murdered out here in the rich. Then my other nephew get killed just on a random drive by. And I'm knowing if I would have been out there, I was out there for one. You know what I mean? Nothing I could do. But the other one, he, he didn't have his dad. And he was running with the wrong people. And I'm still not doing what I'm supposed to be. So I can't nurture him like I need to do. You know what I mean? These kids need it. So that's why we're here. But it starts at home. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, but yeah. everything starts at home. Yeah, everything you know what I mean? starts at so, home. But yeah, so, go ahead. What I'm I done. what I want to say is that that's this is this is the problem with normalizing trauma, right? Normalizing trauma. Um, <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're going to um, we're actually I'm gonna I'm gonna read out right now really quick. Uh, you know, RCA is an organization that is you know uh, needing funding. Uh, to promote some of the activities that we provide to the communities. Uh, we have a website that you can go to at RCA at Returning Citizens Associ which is A-S-S-O-C dot org. That is RCA at Returning Citizens, plural, Associ A-S-S-O-C dot org. Uh, you can Venmo, PayPal, whatever um, is on that site. Um, <clears throat> at this time, I'd like to say that uh, that uh, Nina is gonna he, she's gonna she's gonna give a, a a poem that she had written regarding uh, regarding domestic violence. Um, and then what I'd like to say is that we have brochures on the table that is uh, provided uh, regarding uh, RCA and what we do. Um, I would also like to offer anyone in the audience, if you have any questions, that uh, we'll go ahead and take questions for about 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll wrap this up. So, Nina, would you? 
Okay, sorry, you guys. I had a poem with my story, and I got so excited and animated, as Ramon said, <laughs> that I forgot to uh, I forgot to say it. But I want to piggyback on what Ramon said. Um, kids need their fathers. You know, I wish I would have grew up with my father, but I did. But I met him when I was eighteen, and I didn't have any resentments at all. I just liked the time that I spent with him. So I'm going to read this. I know it would have been totally different if my father was in my life. So this is a domestic violence. Like I said, um, the red flags, you got to watch out for them. First it starts with a slap. Later he's beating the crap out of her. He didn't mean it. He was upset about losing his job. Now that he lost it, he feels like a failure and a slob. Her supportive friend says, that's no reason to take it out on you. You've been by his side and paid your dues. She's thinking, what have I done wrong? While he's singing that same tired song. He's feeling bad for a couple of hours while you're crying and hurting in the shower. He makes her feel like shit. <coughs> People are saying, what a dumb bitch. <coughs> Drugs have played a major part. Seems they both have to make a new start. Why do she stay in this relationship when every other day she's getting whipped? Tell me, how can she get away when he's on her jock every day? <coughs> can't wear this, can't wear that. Sometimes she sleeps with a knife or a bat. What good does it do, though? Because he's running the show. In their eyes, it seemed easy for her to leave. But she'd rather stay in it for her family not to grieve. It would be a shame to have such a loss just because her man wanted to be the dominating boss. Barely can call family or friends. She's at her wit's end. She never thought her man would hit her in a million years. It used to be happiness. Now she shed nothing but tears. She says to herself, he can change. Each day he's acting more and more deranged, coming in the house already in a mad rage, treating her like she belongs in a cage. The sad part is she loves him still, even though he beats her in the grill. Today is broken ribs and a black eye. All she can do is put her head down and cry. One day, she may have the courage to leave. Until then, she must put him at peace about everything she <coughs> does and say, hoping she won't end up in the coroner's office today. One more time in a hospital bed, wishing this time she was dead. Too young to have all this stress. All she does is pray, hope, and guess. What will tomorrow bring? A lot of anger, pain, bruises, and stings. She hates herself for not fighting back, being afraid in her own little apartment shack. She wants to give up so bad, but she keeps remembering what they used to have. Finally, she's at rest and peace, nothing but silence. Another victim caught up in domestic violence. Thank you. Questions, answers? Uh, does anyone have any quick? Oh, I'm sorry, Rachel, go ahead. Is there anything? Oh, very good. Yeah, any, any questions? Um, okay. But hey, ask us anything. We're open books. Oh, Lord, we're more wise. This must be for Marcus. Huh? <laughs> for you. All the business. No, this isn't um, a question, just a comment. I just wanted to say that. RCA has been so important to me from being on the other side. Um, I'm not an RCA member in that fact. I've never been to jail. I don't know. I'm a very straight arrow. But for me, it's important because in our situation, there are times and questions that I just don't understand. I have no understanding. I just, I don't see any reasoning in why. You know, why did you do this? Why did you do that? So for me to be able to hear the conversations that these gentlemen and women have, and they can under, they can, how do I say? They have the format to understand what each of them are going through, what they've been through. They can give him that understanding that I cannot give him. Um, and it's important because it gives me another insight and have understanding and compassion for what he went through, what he still goes through, um, I, cannot, I can only imagine what it is 
to be. I always say, and I say it jokingly, but I say all the time, I cannot be Big Bertha's baby. I'm not a jail person. I, I just would not do well there, you know. So, but for me to have this platform, for him to be able to voice his uh, concerns, his situations, and to allow me to have some kind of insight in what he's been going through and what he will continue to go through. Because sadly, in our society, it's a label. And right. you never get rid of that. You're always a criminal. You're always an ex-convict. You're always a bad person. They don't look at, you know, the things that you've had to go through to get where you are now and to where you will continue to go. Um, so in all that, I just said for me, it's very, very important because it gives me some understanding in where he is, where he's been, where he's going. Because in my own world, I, I don't have a clue. And I don't want to be um, angry and bitter. And those things are very easy to go through because I just don't understand, right? Uh, understanding is zero. Well, why did you do this? Well, you know, there's just no understanding. You get a job, you go to work, you do things the right way. Um, but again, as he said, in his world, these things are going on. You have to figure out how you're going to eat, how you're going to provide for your sister, how are you going to do these things, right? And again, that's just something I don't understand. So on the flip side of that, it gives me some understanding and again, what he has been through, what he's going to go through and not be so judgmental because, you know, we can be very gentle. Like, you did this and you did that and, da, 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 and not also understand the stress that you put on that person because you're expecting them to be, you know, and I told him when you come home, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing the test is going to be when you hit that ground, right. when you hit the ground and you're outside, <clears throat> all these people and all these things and cell phones and you're down for 10 years, the world has changed in those 10 years, without a doubt, and for you to step out like, oh yeah, I've got this, no, you're 10 years behind and you have to catch up, <laughs> right, and all of these things are happening and going and people and jobs and he went to so many job interviews, he had all the qualifications for fire, well no, uh, you can't go out of the county because we can't test you. What do you mean test me? I'm in a fire crew. What, where am I going to get anything to do? But that's their mentality, and there's <coughs> nothing that you can do about it. They just control your life, and again, I just don't understand. And then I'm putting more stress on him because I don't understand. Do it, something, change it. You know, d There's nothing you can do. You have to learn to deal with whatever they throw at you. And to me, that is, there's no more resilience. When you get totally turned down and they take your application and just throw it in the trash can, you don't know what this person does, what skills they have, what, what they can provide. You know, and for me, it's something better because they have lived these lives, right? right. It used to be, oh, you have people, therapists, and they're reading this out of a book. Like, oh, you went through this. Well, let me see yeah. the answer is you have to do this. Yeah, no. for sure. No, but you guys have been there. You've lived the life. You've been through it. You've done it. You've survived. So you have the skills better than anybody else to tell, tell somebody in that same situation what you can do, how to maneuver, how I maneuvered it. It may not be the same for you, but this is what I did to give you some insight in how to do that. Um, so, again, I'm... Edie, I just want to say, um, tell you this. You probably didn't know this, but you are a member of RCA. <laughs> Absolutely. I just met, you know, on my this side of my <laughs> A stigma, right? I just wanted to say from a person on the other side of RCA, this, this organization has been so um, detrimental in changing Ms. DeSanda's life. Um, he had been clean, he had been out, but it's like, you know, you're, you're, I don't know how to say, you're, you know, just a robot. Okay, this is what I have to do because this is what I have to do. Not really what I want to do. And I don't have passion about that. And now I see that passion in his eyes. I see the excitement to get up, to come to these meetings. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And be able to see the need out there. There's so many young people, young men, 
you know, this is part of our history. It's always been for, I don't know how many centuries, right? They just separate the family. And it's still yep. that way. Yep. I remember going to visit him, and it's like the things that they would put you through. Oh, you can't wear this. Oh, you can't wear that. Oh, you have to, you know, like this. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, are you purposely trying? Yep. Yes. They yep. purposely are trying to separate that family. Right. And it's sad because in the time that we were even together, we would see so many couples in visiting, like, oh, hey, how are you? And little by little, they're gone. And this one's gone. And I'm a question, what happened to them? Oh, mom, don't ask. And I was like, well, I want to know. What the hell happened to them? Because I'm on the same road. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, what happened to them could the possibly happen to me, too. You know, but again, I'm going to stop ranting. I just, I'm thankful for RCA. I'm thankful for all of you guys showing up. I remember the first time we did this, there might have been five people. You know, and I know it takes time, but this is so, so important. It's so imperative that these people that are coming home, number one, have the support. Because when you, you think, oh, before, oh, I need this, I need this, and, the, and when you hit the ground, you realize that you didn't need any of those things. It's a whole another plethora of tools that you need that you may not have. So for you guys as well, thank you for putting yourselves out there because people are rough. They, we judge, you know. So thank you guys for putting yourselves out there, and uh, I appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. You know, um, on, on, on my parole, my, my parole officer, he, he, he told me when I when he came and personally handed me my thing and said, you're off, and I'm fucking glad, because <laughs> you're a pain in my ass. <laughs> Cause I was riding. If I if it's something that's free, I want it. If y'all got bus passes, I want it. If y'all got a, a foos, I want it. Yeah, I want some boots. I, whatever you. Well, we don't have that. Well, why? Why? Because y'all supposed to be helping us transition. See, the the one I had, like I was I was holding them accountable to shit. And then y'all got me wasting time in this dumbass class on some behaviors. I don't have a behavior problem. I have a lack of work problem. I have a need some finance problem. So why am I in this class that offers me nothing? Like I used to go hard on my PO. When when my when my parole was up, that man personally came to my house and said, "Here, and I'm glad you're off. I don't have to deal with you no more." Thank everybody for coming out. We Thank really you appreciate guys for it. Coming.